deceit or deception, one of the overriding themes of Macbeth, is the deliberate concealment or misrepresentation of the truth, or the act of causing someone to accept as true or valid what is false or invalid. The contrast between appearance and reality pervades the play, as well as words which form a semantic field of deception and concealment, such as false, betray, deceive, equivocation, palter, beguile, mock, blanket, pall, juggling fiends, and hide, to name only a few. There is extensive use of contrasting imagery throughout, especially that relating to light, dark and eyesight. For Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, darkness allows deceit to flourish as heinous acts can be carried out, not only without detection by others, but also so that they can fool themselves that they have not actually done the deed. Stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires, the eye wink at the hand, yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. Here Macbeth tries to separate what his hand does from what his eye or his conscience sees. Both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth summon the darkness to hide their actions. Before the arrival of Duncan to the castle, Lady Macbeth proclaims, Come, thick night, and pull thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. In anticipation of Banquo's murder, Macbeth cries, Come, sealing night, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand, cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. The adjective sealing here refers to the practice in falconry, of stitching up a young bird's eyes for the purposes of training. He commands night to cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. The darkness allows him to deceive himself that the great bond which ties him to Banquo and keeps him pale or cowardly no longer exists. The witches deliberately mislead Macbeth in order to exploit his ambition and cause murder and mayhem, while both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth deceive not only their king, but also their peers in order to fulfil their all-consuming ambition. Once Macbeth has committed murder, he is trapped in a spiral of deceit. His musing, if the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all, is just wishful thinking as the murder triggers a series of events which necessitate further deceit in ever more futile attempts to cover his tracks. Shakespeare tells us right from the start that this is to be a play about deceit and betrayal. The witches introduce the idea in Act 1, Scene 1, that things will not be as they seem as they proclaim, Fair is foul and foul is fair and this sets the tone for the rest of the play. What appears to be fair on the surface, i.e. Macbeth's prophecies of ennoblement, and his and his wife's sham obsequiousness and protestations of loyalty to their king's face, is actually foul, as the pair are simultaneously plotting his murder, and will eventually themselves end up dead. And what is foul, i.e. the murder of Duncan, Lady Macbeth's madness and suicide and Macbeth's descent into depravity, ending with his death at the hands of Macduff, is actually fair, if you're looking at it from the perspective of the witches, who celebrate an inversion of the natural order of things. Note the use of alliteration here. The repetition of the initial f sounds irrevocably connects the two concepts together in our minds. Deception also preoccupies King Duncan. He deplores the way in which he was tricked into trusting the treacherous Thane of Cawdor. He laments to his son that there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. 
In other words, there is no skill which allows you to read the truth of a person's character or what they are thinking in their face. Cordor's outward show of loyalty was merely an act to conceal his treacherous thoughts and actions. No truer words than these are spoken in the play, as the irony is, of course, that Duncan, after having declared, No more that thane of Cordor shall deceive our bosom interest, will go on to do exactly that by trusting Macbeth, who is the next thane of Cordor, in much the same way. Images connecting the face with deceit litter the play. Both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth can be described as Machiavels. Niccolo Machiavelli was an Italian Renaissance writer and philosopher, most famous for his work The Prince, written in 1513. Machiavelli used his own experience as a diplomat to write a treatise on how to acquire and maintain power, which included a willingness to commit evil deeds if necessary, even though moral behaviour was the preferred option. Machiavelli's work has, however, been gravely misunderstood, as it merely comprised his calm, dispassionate observations of what actually happened in politics, rather than an enthusiastic encouragement of what he would like to see happen. Even by the time Shakespeare was writing, Machiavelli had been demonised as a man who, under the devil's influence, was driven to lead good men to their doom, and a Machiavel, to quote Shakespeare, was a character who was subtle or cunning, notorious and murderous, or someone who puts on a false appearance of virtue as a cover for their malevolent power-seeking. Shakespeare uses dramatic irony to highlight deception in the play through the structuring of scenes and the use of soliloquy and asides, which allow the characters to speak their thoughts aloud without any other characters hearing them. Both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, in separate scenes, publicly lavish Duncan with promises of loyalty, minutes after having privately contemplated his murder. Even though at the end of Macbeth's soliloquy at the end of Act 1, Scene 3, he seems to have resolved not to act, If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir? How deceitful is he being in the next scene when he professes to Duncan, The service and loyalty I owe, in doing it, pays itself. Your Highness's part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do what they should by doing everything safe toward our love and honour. Can we trust him even at this point? Probably not, because as soon as Macbeth has an opportunity to take stock after hearing that Duncan has settled the crown on Malcolm, he reveals in another aside, immediately after Duncan has addressed him, my worthy Cordor, the Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap, for in my way it lies. Likewise, in Act 1, Scene 5, Lady Macbeth declares in a soliloquy that the raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. In the very next scene, however, Lady Macbeth obsequiously flatters Duncan and professes her loyalty to him. All our service, in every point twice done and then done double, were poor and single business to contend against those honours deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. Lady Macbeth seems to believe that Macbeth needs a certain amount of tutoring in the art of deception. She fears his nature is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. She worries that he would not play false to seize the crown. When she is with him, she chastises him that his face is a book where men may read strange matters. Macbeth doesn't appear to have a good poker face at this point, and she is clearly afraid that he will inadvertently give them away. She gives him some advice. To beguile the time, look like the time, bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Here Lady Macbeth encourages her husband to act the part of a loyal subject. He needs to look or appear to act appropriately for the time or the event of the king's visit. His eye or his facial expression, his hand or his mannerisms, and his tongue or his words all need to create a false impression of welcome 
in order to lull the king into a false sense of security. She also urges him to look like the innocent flower but be the serpent under it. Shakespeare combines the subtle differences between a simile and metaphor in one powerful image to enhance this idea of deceit. A simile is a figure of speech that suggests mere similarity of two separate items, while a metaphor is a figure of speech that suggests the two items of comparison are one and the same. He needs to assume the superficial qualities of an innocent flower, presumably of enticing purity and innocuousness, while simultaneously being the evil lurking underneath ready to bite when the unwitting Duncan comes too close presumably to either smell the flower or to pick it. The word serpent is clearly a reference to Satan and suggests that Lady Macbeth has totally given both of themselves up to the powers of darkness as she exhorts him to be the devil. This would have been shocking for a contemporary audience. When Macbeth appears to falter after the banquet with Duncan, her influence over him is clear as he commands himself in language reminiscent of hers. Away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. Here, the word mock means to imitate or pretend. The repetition of the word false here is used to imply two separate meanings. A false face is a face which is not a true reflection of its owner's emotions and intentions, while a false heart is one which is disloyal. Lady Macbeth, for all her fears that Macbeth was too full of the milk of human kindness, is ultimately a victim of self-deception. Her exhortations to the spirits that tend on mortal thoughts to stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it, deceive her into believing that she is impervious to remorse. Her subsequent guilt is such that sleep does not give her rest or respite from her conscience, which compels her to sleepwalk while reliving the murder and its aftermath, as she laments, What, will these hands ne'er be clean? Macbeth and his wife are trapped in a web of deceit from the moment Duncan is killed as they try to change the appearance of reality in order to cover their tracks. To divert attention from themselves, they smear the drunken guards with blood so that it appears they, under the orders of Malcolm and Donalbane, are to blame, and then put on their nightgowns so that it seems as though they've been in bed. Get on your nightgown lest occasion call us and show us to be watchers. Macbeth then perpetuates the notion that Duncan's sons have fled because they are in fact guilty and are desperate to sow a false narrative about what has happened. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide, filling their hearers with strange invention. Paranoid, Macbeth is soon convinced that Banquo is also a threat and resents the fact that he has committed heinous acts for someone else's benefit. For Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan, I have murdered. He engages Banquo in conversation, appearing to be concerned that he attend the banquet. But he interweaves disingenuous questions designed to find out Banquo's plans. Ride you this afternoon? Is't far you ride? And... Goes Fleance with you. He then deceives the murderers into thinking that they have a motive to kill Banquo. Are you so gospeled to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours for ever? Deceit is shown to breed deceit, and Macbeth begins to deceive even his own wife and accomplice, commanding her that, At the banquet, he has no intention that Banquo should ever attend. She must let her remembrance apply to Banquo, present him eminence both with eye and tongue, and make our faces visits to our hearts, disguising what they are. He is even deceiving her about her need to deceive in the first place. Turning to the witches, if we look at what they say in their prophecies, we can see that they never actually lie. 
Their art of deception is much more subtle in that they tell the truth, but in such a way that the real meaning of what they say is more obscure than what it appears to signify. Banquo demonstrates that he is on to them right from the start. He warns Macbeth. And oftentimes, to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. They will win our confidence by telling us small things that are true, in order to deceive us into falling into a deadly trap. Indeed, the very first things that they say to Macbeth are truthful. All hail, Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Glams. All hail, Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor. The next prophecy, all hail, Macbeth, that shalt be king hereafter, is slightly more problematic and is where the witch's deceit actually begins, as they use his dormant ambition against him to trick him into acting when he otherwise would not have done. Is it truly a prophecy or can it more accurately be defined as a self-fulfilling prophecy? The witches certainly cannot be said to be lying, as he does indeed become king. But would he have done if they hadn't told him he would? When Macbeth first hears the prophecy, he declares, to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, i.e. it is not something that even his ambition has permitted him to hope for. Having heard the prophecy, though, and having allowed it to awaken his dormant ambition, Macbeth, after finding out that Duncan has settled the crown on Malcolm, believes that it will only come true if he does something about it, and thus the prophecy becomes self-fulfilled. The witches essentially are equivocators. Equivocation is the use of ambiguous language to conceal the truth. The prophecies that they give to Banquo are cryptic and appear self-contradictory. Lesser than Macbeth and greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. It is only as the play progresses that we work out that though Banquo may be lesser, in degree or status than Macbeth, and not so happy or fortunate as he, he is still greater or much happier, or much more fortunate, as his superior moral character means that he will go down in posterity as the illustrious sire of a whole line of kings. What these prophecies actually do is to deceive Macbeth into thinking that Banquo is his rival when he is not. In Act 4, Scene 1, Macbeth is desperate for reassurance from the witches, which allows the equivocation of the apparitions they conjure to mislead him. Their pronouncements are ambiguous, and Macbeth interprets them in their most literal sense, or in a way that is beneficial to him. When the second apparition tells him to be bloody, bold and resolute, and to laugh to scorn the power of man for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth, He is immediately comforted and deceives himself into believing that he is invincible. Then live, Macduff, what need I fear of thee? Not thinking for a moment that Macduff is not of woman born, as he came into the world by what we now know as Caesarean section. When the third apparition declares that Macbeth shall never vanquished be until Great Burnham Wood to High Dunsinane Hill shall come against him, he immediately dismisses that this can ever happen. That will never be. Who can impress the forest, bid the tree and fix his earthbound root? Sweet bodement's good. Even though the prophecy comes true through the more prosaic means of the opposing forces cutting down the branches of the trees in Burnham Wood to hide behind them in order to disguise their numbers, it is ironic that Macbeth is quite ready to believe in supernatural forces that allow the witches not only to tell the future, but also to turn nature upside down, including uprooting trees. Yet he is not willing to believe that supernatural forces will uproot a forest and cause it to move in order to vanquish him. As we've just seen, Macbeth is as much a victim of self-deception as he is a deceiver, and this is where the witches truly have their power. He believes what he wants to hear. When there are reports that Burnham Wood appears to be advancing on him, he declares that he begins to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. 
when he finds out that Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped, he admits that this is exactly what he has done. And be these juggling fiends no more believed that palter with us in double sense, i.e. that trick us with double meanings, that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. Or, in other words, keep their promises as we hear them to be, but not as we hope them to be. To quote Hamlet, another Shakespeare play, Macbeth has been hoisted by his own petard. In other words, the deceiver has been destroyed by his own deception. Banquo's warning in Act 1, Scene 3 has surely come back to haunt him. The word equivocation would have had much more resonance for the Jacobean audience than it does today. When the porter answers the knocking at the gate at the beginning of Act 2, Scene 3, he introduces a selection of imaginary characters as though they are entering the gates of hell. Faith, here's an equivocator that could swear in both the scales against either scale, who committed treason enough for God's sake yet could not equivocate to heaven. Oh, come in, equivocator. This is a reference to the Jesuit, or Catholic, priest Father Garnet, who was executed in 1606 for his alleged complicity in the gunpowder plot, which was a failed assassination attempt against the Protestant James I by English Catholics led by Robert Catesby. The use of equivocation by the Jesuits was a way in which they could tell the truth in such a way that they kept secrets from those they felt were not entitled to know them. Jesuits would, therefore, equivocate to protect themselves or others without committing the sin, in their eyes, of actually lying. Protestants, however, believed that the Jesuit doctrine of equivocation was merely a justification for deceit. The way in which Shakespeare links equivocation with the infernal forces of the witches is his way of demonising the Jesuits, and carrying favour with the Protestant James I. The scales in this image probably refer to the metaphorical scales of justice, and how Father Garnet used doublespeak in an attempt to give testimony neither for nor against the accused. The Porter's, and therefore Shakespeare's, contempt for equivocators is clear, as he declares that Father Garnet yet could not equivocate to heaven, suggesting that God is not to be hoodwinked by such manipulation of language. The fact that the equivocator is knocking on the hell gate implies the evil inherent in the practice. The deceits perpetrated by the witches, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, causing the death of a divinely appointed king, result in a turmoil so earth-shattering that the natural world is turned upside down as a result. In Shakespeare's day, there was a widespread belief in the great chain of being, which was a rigid social hierarchy set out by God who was at the top of it along with the angels. Kings and queens were ranked just below and so were answerable only to God. The fact that Macbeth upsets the chain by rising above his station through foul means throws nature into a state of uproar. Macbeth and his wife are not only guilty of deceiving others, but are also victims of their own self-deception, which contributes to their downfall. In Macbeth's case, he allows himself to believe what he wants to hear and by convincing himself he is invincible, ultimately puts himself in a position where he is vulnerable to Macduff. As for Lady Macbeth, she allows herself to believe that she is immune from a guilty conscience, but it is this which will lead her to madness and suicide. Deception perpetrated by the mortal characters in the play does not end well, and Shakespeare's message, in the aftermath of a gunpowder plot, which sought to assassinate King James I, seems to be that political power should never be gained by deceit. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.